Friday. I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore. On Monday, the screens are a little dry. Um, we have been talking about and had just finished up sort of a group or class activity, talking a little bit about internal and external fertilization. We've been talking about intermittent organs. Okay, and so we're really looking at what were the benefits and disadvantages of each, right? Because we know we have both techniques, right? We talked a little bit about how being on land will certainly limit you, okay? Um, but even if you're in the water, right, we compared things like sharks versus fishes, right, there's more to it than just, well, when you're on land, right, your eggs or whatever certainly can't get fertilized after they're laid because they're going to be hard. Okay, even when you're in the water, we talked about things like, well, internal fertilization is good for dad, right, or good for baby. My babies get more protection. They can grow bigger. Dad knows he's dad. And those are all good. Okay, but bad for mom because she's fat and delicious, okay? And we talked about external fertilization, okay? How these tend to be less good for baby, right? The death rate is significantly higher and potentially less good for dad, right? There's more competition and he's less likely to either be or know at least that he's dad, right? But maybe better for mom, right? Because she's not holding on to baby. <sighs> Mass just really wants to be in my mouth today. Because she's not hauling around all those offspring. So she's less of a target for meals. So we want to use this to think about okay, how we can break down, remember, as our goal, our subclasses under Class chondrichthys. And how do these different reproduction types manifest themselves? So what might we expect to see? So we already know that with our elasmobranchii, shark skates and rays, that we tend to see internal fertilization. And this is something we saw with our dogfish, primarily the use of some kind of intermittent organ, right? When we saw, for example, and largely the use of that clasper. Okay. So then how are our babies born after the fact? Okay, so we do see a little bit of variety within this. Okay, so one example, right, we have some oviparity. Okay, egg laying, remember? Okay, so these are eggs that hatch outside mom's body. Okay, so these tend to be what chondrichthys eggs look like, a little outside our expectation. Okay, they coin the name mermaid's purse, right, because when they first wash up on the shore, so we're used to engaging with the, right, they look like this. I've had a few colleagues that have had these. They look very cool. They feel a little leathery. If you ever get the chance to touch them, right? But so it looks like it has like a little handle. Like to carry it around, neat little leather bag. Okay. And then of course inside is the growing embryo of different types. Okay, so this is really common. <clears throat> Okay, many of our organisms do this, right? So this is a nurse shark here. Nurse? nurse. Mm -hmm. It also happens to be one of the few that can sit still. Right, so she would also be doing both water pumping and ram ventilation, which is unusual. <clears throat>
this being on the other side, so maybe we'll move it. Hmm. Okay. We know, right, that we do see ovoviviparity. Right? This is what our dogfish had, right? What we had in class. Okay. We even had the opportunity to see this a little bit. Do you remember when we say ovoviviparity? Right, we can break this word down. Okay, that ovo, that first part means there are eggs. Okay, but they hatch. Okay, so if we have eggs, okay, that means we have egg yolks. Okay, but those eggs hatch inside of mom, okay? They continue to feed off the yolks of the eggs, but they're safe and protected and continue to grow inside mom for a short period of time. <clears throat> okay, so we have our egg, right? Egg hatches. Okay, so some benefit to mom here in this version is while baby grows, right, baby's not taking more nutrients from mom. Right, right, they're just getting their prepackaged picnic lunch. <clears throat> now, she's still big and fat. That's going to slow her down. We see that loss of that fusiform shape. All right, so that's still a problem for her. Okay, she weighs more. That's an energetic cost. And she's still a delicious target because she's so large. Okay, but there's the benefit of not the continual feeding of the offspring, which is good for her. Okay, and there's the benefit to the offspring that since they've been kept inside, right, they're better protected than if they'd been laid. So they can be born, right, much bigger, right, than if they'd been hatched as little eggs on the ground, the size they would have been born then, right. And the bigger you are when you're released into the environment, remember, this is one of our internal fertilization rules, right? The bigger, stronger, more likely you are to survive. So we're giving baby shark, right, a little bit of a leg up here. So does this hatch inside or outside? So these hatch inside, right? So by the time they come out, they would be quite large. Okay, and here in the second picture, right, because they haven't been born yet, you can see, we can still see that yolk sac attached to them. Right, from that egg they originally hatched from. When we had these, right, our uh, sharks were quite small, so all we could really see were the yolk sacs. Good. Oops, lost some crap on here. Okay, and remember from the beginning of the semester when we first defined the parity, we do have this as well. Okay, it's the most rare among our chondrixes, but it does happen. Hi, so for example, our great whites do it. In case they weren't nightmare fuely enough, right? Okay, and we mean this right in the, the purest possible way, right? So, right, they're free right, in mom, and then they're born free swimming, right? So there's no egg step at all. Right, that's the key here. No egg, right, no yolk. Okay, this is what we really mean by viviparity, okay? Free and lively, the whole step, the whole stage, right? From fertilization 
to parturition to birth, right? Okay, and in this case, right, not all cases are we using placentas, but in this case, great whites actually also do use placentas, which is unusual and kind of what, both weird and cool. Yes, that's a great question. So Maria is talking about how many animals, if they have placentas or tissue that comes out, any kind of tissue that comes out with birth, how it's very commonly um, consumed. And that is also the case here. Okay? And that happens for a lot of reasons, like if you've ever had kittens or puppies or if you grew up on a farm. You see that kind of behavior, right? In part, right, because it helps baby, it gets them clean, but also in part because it's, it's a lot of energetic tissue that's been expelled from mom, right? And giving birth is, it's exhausting, right? So this is sort of a way to very quickly replenish energy um, so you can kind of get up and get more energy, right? So it's very common. You would see sharks do it, right? In addition, when you're talking about areas like water or parents that have also just given birth, right, that smell is in the air or in the water as appropriate. So as much of that as you can remove from that space and then immediately move, the safer both you and your offspring if you care. Okay, Great White Shark probably does not. But some do, right? And so the amount of that you can remove because you're not going to be able to move right away is also going to help. Okay, great question. Anything else before we move on from baby sharks? I know we can't like ask it obviously, but is, <laughs> is birth just as painful like for animals as it is for humans? Like the birth process is It's a great question. So I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Now that being said, like animals that like we have, so domesticated and farm animals do go into distress some die, yeah. some die right they do seek help or comfort when they're going through birth um so there is indication it's just as painful right it's still a very small space for a large thing to be going through so you have to imagine so I see some birds laying eggs and think, oh gosh. So <laughs> I have to imagine, right? A kiwi egg is like the size of its body. I have no idea how that even happened. So go her. Must it must be. I have to assume that it must be. A long time ago, my dog went into labor all my day, like 2 a.m. And I woke up and there were like puppies on me. And I was like, okay, okay, oh. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> So puppy is seeking comfort for a very important day. Well, I think she's just showing me. She's like, look what I did. Look what I did. <laughs> I had puppies. And the whole thing, like the first she's like, 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 Okay. Ooh, good load. So within our elasmo brachia, remember shark skates and rays. We basically have two methods for feeding. I actually thought it was my computer, so I just had a small heart attack. So you're good. <laughs> Woo! So we normally think of the carnivorous option. Right, where we have things like our sharks, right, um, or our rays going about, right, and actively hunting, attacking, and consuming um, other fishes, okay, or we were even talking about cannibalistic tendencies, right, so this certainly is common, okay, 
Many, many sharks, skates, and rays do do this. All right, this is why when we were talking about um, vision and protective features, we talked about all these things that they do to protect their eyes and their faces during the hunt. And why we talked about things like tooth replacement. All right, these were very important features because so many of these organisms do do this. That being said, right, it is not the sole way in which organisms um, in this subclass are feeding. And so we do have quite a lot of filter feeders, um, meaning that they're filtering plankton out. Okay, we largely think of this being algae. This can also mean small marine plankton, so just things that are microscopic. So basically small shrimpies. doesn't count as being carnivorous. Don't look at me. Okay. So really good examples of, come on, of this. <laughs> Um, are things like the manta ray or the basking shark, right, that can take large amounts of small animals like krill. <coughs> and basically what they do is they keep their mouths open, right, and swim. So ultimately as they're doing ram ventilation <coughs> or using some kind of suction, they're getting these small bits in. Hi. That basking shark is ruining somebody's day because um, they're also taking small fishes. <clears throat> so he's combining both filter feeding, or she, um, and some carnivory together. Hi. <clears throat> Something like a manta ray right, is going to be straight up filter feeding. Right? So they're going to take very small things. As they drive around, drive around, swim around, their mouths don't even really close very well. And so we can see, right, basically all of these rakers or nets in their mouths that basically allow them to catch these miniature plankton as they swim, right? So food gets caught in their mouth, fresh water gets put over their gills, they just sort of live their life cruising around these very peaceful giant sea flat flaps in the ocean. I feel like my YouTube recommends here are about as good as my Netflix recommends. Uh. These ones? Yeah, they're quite large, right? Yes, yeah, so they're big water, um, elasmobranchii, and the wingspan of them might be somewhere between tip to tip Maria to Kaylee here. So they're quite substantial. Yeah, if they put their like pectoral fins around you, you would feel like they were like a third person in a photo, right? They could kind of like put their wings around your shoulders. They're quite substantial. They're shorter, right, but they're wide. So when they run, or run around, boy, these are doing everything but swimming today. When they're moving around in the water with their mouth open, right, this is quite a large gape. <laughs> Rude. These ones do not, right? So rays in general do have a subfamily that sting, right? And this is the same um, subfamily that killed, for example, Steve Irwin. Okay, so there are um, species that sting. These ones do not. Okay, and that comes from the famous, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but that tail, right? Some of these pointy tails have barbs and stingers on them. So the ones that hunt do so more aggressively. <clears throat> Things like the manta ray, though, are very, very peaceful. You could basically ride them if they let you and be fine. These are very common at like large aquariums. 
right? Pet the animals. These are going to hang out with like the dolphins and stuff. You can interact with these. <coughs> People just think they're less cute than dolphins, so they're not usually as popular an attraction. I heard that if you're pregnant, you can't go like film with dolphins because then they distract it because like how like they can they know you're pregnant and they get excited. And so you can't be there because, like, basically, all the surrounds you. Oh my gosh, you're happy. No, I'm not loving that at all. <laughs> okay, keep in mind, right? So we mentioned this in the previous slide that we have both types of respiration here. Okay, our RAM ventilation is most common, right? So when in doubt, okay, all sharks. Skates and rays will do ram ventilation. All right, remember this is the standard. So anytime that they're moving, all right, that's the swimming around with our mouth open, right, letting that water go through my mouth and across my gills. All right. In addition, to the ram ventilation, right? Some species can also do the buccal or the water pumping, right? Remember, buccal is another word for mouth. We're going to see this one a lot. This is that mouth pumping. Okay, so this is the skate. Okay, so we can see here his tail is much chubbier than the one we saw in the previous picture. And we'll talk about the difference between skates and rays in a second. <clears throat> okay, but pretty much if you see anything just like sitting still for a long time, right, they're gonna be able to do that buccal pumping. So many skates can, right, we saw in those previous images that the nurse shark can, right? So a lot of these smaller, smaller sharks can do this, a lot of smaller things, right? Like our nurse and lemon. Okay, so when we looked at the egg pictures, right, that's what we were looking at there. Okay, as well as many of our smaller skates and rays. So I think that's going to sit, right? If you can or need to sit still, right, nurse sharks get their name because they sit and have nurseries, right, they protect their eggs. But if you're going to sit still, right, this guy's camouflaged, he, so one of his goals is to hide and ambush, but you got to sit still to do that. So if I'm going to sit still, I have to still breathe, okay? So I need to switch to buccal or water pumping if I'm going to do that. Otherwise, I'll suffocate. But then when I'm moving, if I'm chasing, right, or cruising, okay, the rest of that time, I will use ram ventilation. So with sharks, yeah. So the question is, if they have mouth pumping, will they also always have ram ventilation? And this is true for class chondrichthys, right? It will not always be true. We're going to see mouth pumping or buccal pumping come up a lot. We'll see it in fishes. We'll see it in amphibians, okay? And that will not always be true, right? Our fish will not use ram ventilation, and neither will our amphibians. But this is true for our chondrichthys. We'll talk about why our later classes do not need to use round ventilation. But it is always true here. A good question. <coughs> Anything else about our um, breathing in fishes? Well, chondrichthys. Okay. So let's look at our sharks versus our skates and our rays. Now, you're not going to need to know the Latin terms, but they are there if you're very, very curious. Right? You're never going to need to know more than elasmo Never going to ask you that. At least not as a, like, 
actual question, right? So how can we tell the difference between some of these guys? All right, so most of this is very intuitive, right? And this will help us practice some of our terms. <clears throat> so let's take the first bullet. <clears throat> Lateral versus ventral. <clears throat> okay, so we've seen this word a lot more. All right, we've talked about ventral versus dorsal. Okay, so we can see our gills here. Okay, so these run along under to where the belly is. And that's our ventral side, right? Lateral just means side. Okay. And this is a, a thing we see a lot, right? So here again, we see the word lateral. Okay. In this case, a spiracle. Does anybody remember what the spiracle does from lab? Or what it is? All right. This is one of the things we had to identify. Be good studying for our lab practical. Yep, the big old holes in the head, right? And these are good for water pumping. Okay, so remember, one of the things sharks are not in fact efficient at is getting a lot of water through their body, through their mouth. And this is why they have multiple ways to breathe in many cases. So a spiracle, right, located right, basically, if this were us, right, right here, okay, is another organ that's going to help create more efficient water flow, right, so I can suck it or move it through my mouth, okay, and I can actively suck or pump through holes in my face, okay, but that's what this is, right, there's spiracles, so many water pumping organs, right, or holes, all right, so here we can see, right, lateral again, meaning side. Okay, and here, these are what these are pointing to. These are quite substantial. Okay. And here we see dorsal. Right, and so we know dorsal means back. Okay. Now, all that being aside, really good practice right, with our terms. The most obvious way to tell these guys apart is just simply the shape of their bodies. Right? Our sharks have little pectoral fins. They look like little arms. Okay, meaning not attached to the head, right? I look like a fin. Okay, but when we're talking about our pectoral fins, our arms, on our skates and rays, Okay, these are significantly enlarged, right, and are coming all the way up, right, to touch the head and shoulders, making fundamentally enormous pancake-like wings. Okay, and when we talk about movement in the next unit, right, we'll see that this expansion fundamentally changes the way that they move. Okay, that's not so bad. Okay, so that leaves us with thinking about, well, what's the difference between a skate and a ray then? Because they're basically just giant flat pancakes. <clears throat> so, giant flat pancake one versus two. Okay, all skates and rays, remember, we're all still within the subclass elasmobranchia. Okay, so there are some things 
that we can use to tell these apart. Now, some things that are not ob obvious, right, viviparous versus oviparous, right, meaning skates are the ones that have these mermaids' purse, right, those little eggs, just like the nurse sharks do. Okay, whereas rays are going to be viviparous. Okay, these have live babies. They kind of look like evil raviolis when they're born. Yeah, but it's true, right? We just call it like we see it. So if you've not seen a baby ray, right, we have one thing I recommend you Google when you leave here today. This one will not, in fact, traumatize you for the rest of your life, unlike the duck penis. Right? So highly recommend Googling baby rays. They're very cute and also terrifying. Okay? Next, let's look at the dorsal fin. Okay? So on the skates, we see it says prominent. This is loose, but it's relative, right? So remember, dorsal is the fin that's on top. So we're going to follow, beep, 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 okay, and I see here, all right, a sticky uppy flag, and that's our dorsal fin. Now, compared to what we've been looking at, this is quite minimal, right, but compared to, okay, our ray, okay, this is stabby, so that's not going to count. Okay, or it's greatly reduced, right? So that stabby thing is the closest thing we're going to have to a dorsal fin. I'm going to erase my coloring so you guys can see exactly what we're looking at here. So this is the comparison between the two. So remember we talked about in our manta ray how they have no stabby thing. They're a peaceful giant sea flap flap. So that's what we mean by absent. And you can go back and see that circle we did on that last one. See, it's just completely smooth. Okay, or the one I have here, very stabby. Okay, so this stabby thing, okay, or a spine, is the last thing that becomes important between these two. So the skate, right? has no spine, right? This has the little flag, right? Or a dorsal fin on it, but otherwise it looks pretty chill. And comparatively speaking, right? She thick, right? That tail is quite wide and fleshy. When we compare this to our ray, Okay, and this is what we were alluding to earlier, right? and this looks similar to the manta ray we saw in the previous picture. This is quite stabby or thin. Now, just because it's thin does not mean it will be used for stabbing, okay? All right, but it is quite whip-like, and again, here in this one in particular, we do see that spine, and when you see that spine, Right, this is where you know that it's being used as a weapon, either for hunting or protection. Okay, and again, this is the type of organism that right, inadvertently happened to have killed Steve Irwin, if you're not familiar. Right? Steve Irwin was a documentarian, much like David Attenborough and the like, yeah, when I was your age, so a little while ago. Um, and he was killed by Ray. Now, it was very, like, super random freak accident. Right, they've taken the ray into a boat, okay? The terrified ray, right, was acting in defense and flipped his tail up. Super freak thing, right? The spine and the ray, which are usually tipped in some kind of very light poison, happened to hit him right in the heart. Shot of a lifetime, or at the end of his, if it were. Right, so he died instantly pretty much on a boat, right? No chance of getting anywhere fast enough to help anything. Okay, so very weird. You don't usually die from being hit by a ray, right? It usually just hurts like all get out because it hits you right somewhere in your legs or feet, right? Lots of crying, screaming, inappropriate language is involved kind of thing. Very rarely death. So what's the perception of the skate? Is it So very rarely anything, right? 
So if I was, so her question is, what kind of protection does the skate have? Okay. So we saw before, right? Skates usually have a much different tactic, right? They're much more private animals, so they tend to be more nocturnal. They tend to be more camouflaged. Um, some skates are yeah. electric. So there are some electric skates that exist, much like the electric eel that we talked about. Okay. Those are more obvious. They have a, uh, like blue rings on them. Um, but for the most part, the skate's just a chiller animal, right? And it's more of a flee than fight kind of kind of creature. Is this Gabby? Does the light come out with it? It does not, no. All right, so this is <coughs> a keratin-based um, feature. And so ideally, the spine should not come out when you're stabbed because um, they will not regrow another one. So if they lose or damage their spine, then they're just one less defense. I've seen, like, raised up that hand, and they died because of, like, the, the tail was Yes, yeah. So uh, Maria mentioned that she's had the opportunity to see um, rays and that they can can and do die um, kind of like bees in that way um, if their tail snaps off or is broken or their spines are broken that it will cause them to die yeah. okay so we are just going to lightly introduce our other class Subclass, I'm so sorry. Ooh, I think my watch is slow. That's a bummer. So I guess I'm not actually going to say diddly. Besides, to remind you that they exist. Okay, so remember that was all subclass elasmobranchii. Did not actually put the button. So we do have a whole other subclass, holocephali, right, which are chimeras and ratfish. So remember, of all of the 900 species, which is small enough as it is, right? Excuse me. These guys only make up 33 of them. So when I said that they're a very small portion, right, I mean small and tiny. Okay. So keep in mind, right, and this is one thing we've been keeping track of, our subclasses have to have everything that our class has. This is the same thing with class elas or subclass in elasmobranchia, right? So the key here is these have to have things of their own that's making them separate or weird or special. With these guys, it seems a little more obvious, right? We know that they're going to be doing something fruity loose. the word. Okay, this will be as far as we get for the test, right? I'm not going to put anything up weird to finish this up. This back. Look at this. Um, so all of this through here, right from the end of exam one to today is what will be on your exam on Friday. Okay, your soccer is up. I know I'm super chatty today, which is just terrible. Um, when you're all done, my back two rows may go. And I will not get to see any of you until Monday. Um, so if you need something, particularly from lab, for lab, right, because that will be the next major thing you guys are encountering, or if you come up with something when you're studying, please don't hesitate to ask. Have a wonderful day.